Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Nobody Asked to Me Guy Show. I'm your host, Melvin Casey Lars. And listen, let us offer you a, a brief apology uh, for some reason. And I see all of my, I mean, you know, you guys always support me. So we want to let you know that's why we're late coming on. You know, we don't waste time uh, pontificating aimlessly and uh, giving you cookie cutter things. So this evening, guys, we're going to talk about a very serious topic. And that topic is domestic violence. And we have with us Mrs. Petrina Jenkins. She's Community Education Outreach Manager for Project Celebration located in Shreveport, Louisiana. And Ms. Jenkins is going to be sharing some information with you. Is get your paper, get ready to roll with us. Ms. Jenkins, good evening. Good evening. Thank listen, you for it's, it's, me. listen, it's our pleasure to have you. And uh, we want to uh, understand that they can grab a camera. They can FaceTime you if they have any questions. And you see me looking up, I'm looking at my monitors. If, if our audience, uh, sometimes they join us and talk. Sometimes they just sit back and listen. So sure. without further ado, Ms. Jenkins, I started to uh, uh, talk about some of the things I asked you to send me a bio, and then I decided that I just wanted you to share with us a little bit uh, instead of them listening to me go on and on. Sure. Um, again, my name is Petrina Jenkins. Um, I have been working in the field of domestic violence for um, probably about 22, 23 years now, um, and it is my passion. I feel that it's the very reason that I'm here. Um, I'm a Grambling graduate. Um, I have two sons, and I am yay, tiger. <laughs> yay tigers. I am very, very yay, passionate um, about domestic violence and very passionate about um, issues around women and children. Don't waste your time. We'll jump right in, and I know that we have uh, a lot of things that we can talk about, and and we know we have canned definitions of domestic violence and that kind of thing. However, if you would share with us briefly. What is domestic violence? You know, there's a lot of questions out there and people try to quantify it in so many different ways. Will you share with the audience uh, what we what is being said, uh, the definition? Sure. To domestic so violence. The textbook de definition of domestic violence is a pattern of cohesive behavior used to exude control over another. So that's the textbook definition. So, and it doesn't mention anything physical. Um, it's just whatever type of tactic that's used to control another individual. A question I get a lot of times um, is, <clears throat> if someone hits you once, is that domestic violence? Um, if someone hits you once, will they continue to do that? Or will they continue to be violent? Um, but I've always seen those as isolated incidences, but when it's a pattern involved, when you can, then that's that's the difference for me. Now, as we share that, which brings me to another question. You know, many times we, we again, like I said, we, we quantify domestic violence. And, and many times we hear domestic violence is thought to be personal behaviors, you know, between uh, the spouse and a significant other. And it's not really an emergency uh, overall. You know, people right. just kind of lost their tempers and things got out of hand. Mm -hmm. How would you address an individual that, that shared that information? I mean, do you agree with that, disagree with that, uh, or, or kind of somewhere in the middle? <laughs> mm -hmm. That things got out of hand and that that's, okay. So <clears throat> um, a lot of times I think, especially when there's a victim or survivor in, involved, I think victims tend to downplay um, the abuse. Um, we tend to make excuses for the abuser that it was just like you said, just an incident. It was just things just got out of control. Um, but there are people who have lost their lives for just that thing. Things got out of control. And now those individuals are not here anymore. So I think that any degree of violence in a relationship um, pretty much is unacceptable. Which brings us to a, a very ginger point. And, and, and uh, you and I have had short conversations about this before. And mm -hmm. especially when it involves children. Now, all of us know, and I'm just going to say it flat out, especially in our culture, you know, that there's, a, and we can all quote it, a child needs to stay in a child's place. However, when, when that child is engulfed in a domestic violence situation and we say that a child should stay in a child's place or a child should stay out of grown folks' business, how how is that... Uh, academically, I should say, and domestically 
seen as a grown folks business, if you might. Right. And so it's interesting that you said that, Mr. Lars, because um, yearly, almost 5 million children witness domestic violence. That's a huge, huge population of our children who are actually in homes where domestic violence is occurring. So you think about what that's doing to children. And I grew up in that same type of home. Children stay in a child's place, blah, 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 go to your room. Well, the reality is that even if they go to their room, they're listening. So in households where there's domestic violence, where we call the, the victim is a survivor, well, guess what? The children are secondary survivors. And so a lot of times um, people get out of abusive relationships and they're okay and they've moved on, but they never address the children. And then you you end up growing up with children who have internal anger issues, um, who have lots of issues, even physical illnesses, um, because of witnessing domestic violence. So it's definitely something that we need to take a closer look at the effects on children. Um, I can remember having a case not too long ago um, where the lady was still in the relationship, but you know we started talking about safety planning. And her safety plan was that her six-year-old would go into the closet when things got out of hand, and she knew when it was time to call the police. So imagine being six years old and being responsible to know when it's time to call the police. So that's a lot on a, uh, on a child. Um, also, I know that probably about 40 to 50% of police reports that come in, guess who's making those calls? Children. Yes, yes. The children. So it's, ask, it's, mm -hmm. Go ahead, no, no, please, please continue. No, that's, go ahead, I'm ready. I, I was just going to say, you know, might I ask as, as as this i mean i i know this is a private issue but when this parent say to this child go in the closet and you know when to call the police i mean how do you and, and i guess i'm asking you an unfair question but I may, maybe i should how does one uh uh find themselves in a situation that they think is okay for the child to be involved as long as it's not at the point of calling the police. H have you ever had anyone to really sit down and sit down and talk with you about that? Um, you know, it's a pattern. And so when we talk about safety planning, like when we get with our um, victims or our survivors and we talk about safety planning, and in this particular instance, this was her safety plan, that in her head, this is what worked for her because she felt like she was number one, protecting her child, so that if things did get crazy, that that child was hidden um, and that child was safe. So sometimes it works for survivors and it doesn't really make sense in our heads. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of times. And that's why sometimes when we appear in court and you know we've read all of these things that's happening and then, um, and then that individual gets up in front of the court and says, hey, none of this happened, I wanna drop charges. Well, of course, in our minds, we we can't fathom why this is happening, um, and we don't understand. But in a survivor's mind, just the whole context of the word survivor, um, the fact that they've survived this long. Um, we know also that the most dangerous time of uh, relationships where there's domestic violence is once that individual tries to leave. Over 80% of women who leave violent relationships are killed trying to leave. So that whole dynamic of what works for this individual um, and versus what may what I may think, um, it's a constant battle. It's a constant battle to allow the survivor to lead in her own healing. So as you share that with us, Mrs. Jenkins, and, and all of the all of the things that we're talking about and dealing with right now about uh, police to a change in legislation as a whole as it as it uh, references, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Violence, I'll, I'll call it violence against humanity. Is there ever any conversation uh, with legislators or with individuals that are involved in the judicial process when it comes to domestic violence about changing some of the rules? Because I mean, the st statistics that you're sharing, 80% of, of, of these, and, and I'm assuming, uh, maybe I shouldn't assume, 
but I'm just assuming probably 79.9% of them are women. And then when they decide to leave, then they get murdered. On the other hand, is that when they defend themselves, then they find themselves facing men, jurors many times, men, judges, etc. And then they are again penalized as well as their children. So it's a it's a loaded question, I know, but are, is there any legislation or any talk of any legislation at all of addressing this issue as per women being able to protect themselves and not have to suffer again for trying to stay alive? Sure. And there are certain legislation, certain legislation that has happened over the years. Believe it or not, we've actually come a long way. Um, even just recently, there was legislation passed where um, if you have a protective order and you end up having to um, harm this individual, that that would, if you have a protective order in place, that that would assist you in your, you know, in your court case. So that's a good thing um, because before it wasn't like that. Um, also, the definition of domestic violence had to be changed because it did not include same-sex partners. It did not include um, it didn't include people who weren't married. You know, so the dating violence clause. So it's just kind of baby steps. Um, and of course, we're here in Louisiana, so you know what what passing legislation is like here. But we definitely fight constantly to change the rules. And that comes from listening to survivors, um, allowing them the opportunity to say this works and this doesn't work. You know, it's, it's well, that, that's another story all, all itself. In, 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 in discussing this, this very tenuous issue of domestic violence, you know, and, and getting back again, because I hear so much about it, and this is a question that Dana, uh, Dana is from North Carolina, and Dana is, is asking, that's why you saw me looking up and writing. Dana is saying a slap or a push should not be viewed as a domestic violent act. Now, this is a young lady named Dana is, is saying that and she's making a statement. She's not asking us a question. She's making a mm -hmm. statement. and She's saying a slap or a push should not be viewed as domestic as a domestic violence act. What would you say to Dana? And Dana, feel free to come and get one of these cameras and you can FaceTime uh, uh, Ms. P Ms. Petrina, we're going to call her Mrs. Petrina tonight, uh, at Jenkins tonight, and you can ask her yourself. But in the meantime, we'll try to move on with your question. Sure. Um, I completely understand um, Dana's point, and which kind of goes back to where we spoke before about how an isolated incident is different from a pattern of cohesive behaviors. So it can be true that someone just lost their temper. Um, or they got too angry and that this ha that's absolutely true. Um, and so when people say, um, yeah, well, if they hit you once, they'll hit you twice. You know, if they did it one time, it'll always happen. That's not always true. So when we talk about domestic violence, we're looking at that pattern of behavior. Um, we believe in something called the power and control wheel. Well, we know that domestic violence is not about anger. It's not about a temporary loss of your temper that it is strategically about power and control. Um, if you've ever seen that wheel or if you want to Google it when we get off, the power and control wheel is intricately designed where nothing on that wheel is physical. All of it is psychological and emotional. There's isolation, there's financial abuse, there's using the children, there's um, just so many different types of abuse, even spiritual abuse. So we're not necessarily focusing on the actual hit or the actual physical violence, I think, when we talk about domestic violence. Dana, does that answer your question or does that address your statement? And feel free to come on and get a camera here. You know, I, and, and I, wow, I'm, I'm glad the questions are coming in. Uh, we have Ch Charlene, is it Char okay, we have Charlene from San Diego and Charlene is asking, she said, women and our men that are participants in domestic violence have been known to view it as part of the relationship. And Charlene is asking, do you find that to be fact or fiction? Um, sometimes. And, you know, I'll say this. Um, I'll say this. It depends on how we were raised. Um, it depends on our learned behaviors. Because we know domestic violence is a learned behavior. So if you are a person who has already been hurt, if you've already had, let's say, childhood trauma, um, and you have already equated love with abuse, 
then you're more susceptible to accept abuse and to think that that's okay. So it just depends on the individual and what behaviors they've learned and then also what behaviors they've learned to accept. So. Okay. Okay. Okay, guys, keep them coming. David, Houston, Texas. Okay, David. David's asking, he says, the, and, and, and I don't know if you're being sarcastic or not, David, this is a very serious uh, discussion we're having, but you have the right to have this ax. Now, he said domestic violence is acceptable as long as it does not occur on a regular basis. This is a statement that, that David is making. Now, this could be a fictitious name or whatever. Uh, what, what would you like to say to Mr. David? Sure. Um, domestic violence on any level, of course, is never acceptable. Um, and just like Mr. Lars was saying earlier, when people think, oh, well, it was just a temporary loss, you know, things just got out of hand. Um, those situations can become quickly deadly. Um, and so you have to really think about that, that, you know, when you choose violence, you can always take it too far. Um, and it's just never acceptable in a relationship. Never. Okay. You're getting a lot of thumbs up and hearts, by the way. Now, I, I okay. you, you and I had a few questions prior to coming in. And, and uh, one question is saying, what causes someone to abuse and control his partner? Domestic violence uh, is a choice. Um, batterers commit domestic violence because it works. Um, there's no predisposed condition. It doesn't happen because of alcoholism. It doesn't be happen necessarily because of, you know, something that the, the individual that's being abused has done. It is a clear and concise choice. Um, what we do know also about battering behavior is that it's very manipulative. And so batters are so manipulative that oftentimes they will make their victim think that it's something that they did or that I would not be this way if you didn't do that. Or I wouldn't, if you wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have had to do that. So that's called gaslighting. And so everything becomes your fault. So when we start to make excuses uh, for batterers, then, you know, we're, we're pretty much in trouble because there's absolutely no excuse ever. And there's nothing that should cause a person to be um, violent or someone they love. This question here. Uh, Teresa is from Sacramento. Teresa is saying, my dad, Teresa, we don't know if your dad is still alive or not. Feel free to take the camera. I'll tell her, but she's saying, my dad uh, was an abuser and I love both my mom and my dad. And she said, I, I have, a, I had, so I'm assuming the father's no longer with her. And, and please give me an education here, Teresa. I'm assuming the father's no longer with her, but she's saying, uh, my dad was an abuser. I love both my dad uh, and my mom, but I still have ill feelings toward my dad to this very day. Making a statement, so I, I'm assuming uh, that you are soliciting a, an answer, and that's why I said write the information there, please, or come and get a camera. But I, I, I'm assuming that, that she's seeking an answer here, and maybe you don't, you won't give her an answer, but if you can maybe share some wisdom or insight with her about sure, that, please. Sure. Teresa. Um, you know, and Mr. Lars, another thing that we know, Teresa, even in our communities, is that we oftentimes don't seek out professional help when we need it. Um, PTSD is real. PTSD is absolutely um, caused by witnessing domestic violence. And it's absolutely normal for you to have those feelings um, towards your dad. But I think it's really important that you do look for help, that you get someone to help you to process those feelings in a positive way. So I would definitely seek out some counseling um, because what you've experienced is trauma. It's traumatic. And trauma plays out in so many different ways in your life and probably even some, some ways that you hadn't realized that that internal trauma um, is affecting your life, even your decisions and your relationships. So it's important to get assistance and try to heal. And there's work. There's work involved with healing. You've got to do the work susceptible to experiencing domestic violence. And that's anyone, any socioeconomic background. Um, it happens to black, white, indifferent, um, any background. It can happen to any person at any time, and that's male or female. So violence um, can happen to anyone in a relationship. I also noticed, I I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just going to say, and I think because of that, um, we have to really be careful that we're familiar with some of the warning signs when we do get into relationships and that we're not um, 
we're not overtaken by the facade of who this person is versus who they really are. Um, and so just kind of, you know, knowing your, especially mm -hmm. dating, just kind of knowing your ins and outs of recognizing signs is really important because there's not a, a typical person. There's no sign on the forehead that says, I'm a batterer. Um, you got to look be beyond the wall. Absolutely. And if, if I might add, as we share before we get to another question, I many times when I've worked with, well, a group of, well, I don't want to give people out, give people business away, but there are a group of us over the years uh, that have worked with in different states I've lived in with batterers, uh, let's say, and it's kind of a, to say scare straight may, may be, but uh, we get pretty, pretty intense. And it's amazing at how cowardly, you know, these men, well, it's not amazing to us, but it's amazing at how cowardly these men are when they're dealing with real men. And how, how and how their spouses or significant others actually get upset with us uh, when we identify these guys as cowards. And I always tell people in my own spouse, you know, I said uh, people seem to forget. They say, "Well, oh, he's a football player. He's a boxer. He's a this. He's a that." But they seem to forget when you're in organized sports. It's kind of like when you are when you are in a fight, but you only want to fight when there's a crowd and somebody can stop stop you. So it's very difficult, and I'm making a statement, it's very difficult for us a lot of times to get women to understand that you don't want to accept the fact that your man is a coward because he bullies you. But when he's around other men and there's nobody that's going to stop his behind getting kicked or whatever, it's a totally different person. Mm -hmm. You know, you say disparaging things to them. You even go to the point of, put the, I mean, just all kind of stuff. And what you hear coming out is, well, I'll get my gun. I'll get, you don't do that for your woman for your wife and that kind of thing. So as you share that, and as we talk about this question, is that is that I please allow me as a man to say to women, is that we understand uh, uh, physically many times uh, there is a, a market difference. However, you're dealing with a coward and that's hard for women to accept. It really is, you know, because they see this 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 all American football player or they see this, this, this uh, great boxer and all of this kind of stuff. But in reality, and, you know, it's kind of like the question or statement people make, what does the hunter do when the rabbit got the gun? And so when they are faced with uh, with other men, when nobody's going to stop the fight, they're not going to be any officials, nobody's going to blow any whistles, you just finna get your butt kicked. Mm -hmm. There's a whole different level of, okay. of, of male. I don't call them men. There's a whole different level of male. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just want to share that as you're sharing mm -hmm. and as you share with these young people, Teresa, and the other people about their feelings and how they feel about that. But I, I do want to uh, re, re respect your time. And uh, let's, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about how common is domestic violence? Sure. Um, statistically, every one in three women will be a victim of domestic violence and one in every seven men. Um, you have to look at right now, Louisiana is now fifth in the nation. But for the past six consecutive years, we have ranked in the top three. So there is some um, improvement, but we are still number five in the nation for domestic violence fatalities. And so that's not the number of domestic violence occurrences. We're talking about fatalities, as in the number of women who die at the hands of abuse. So think about that, that Louisiana is now the fifth most dangerous state um, for women to live in. So it's very common. Um, there's so many myths around domestic violence and you just would never know. Um, it's not usually the person that you think it would be. Like you said, the, you think, oh no, not the athlete or oh no, not the pastor. Or, oh no, not the, you know, not this person. But remember, abusers are typically Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And so very manipulative. And so this individual is gonna be someone completely different with you than they are to everybody else. And that's a part of the abuse, that it's manipulation. And that's a part of the isolation because now you believe that nobody else will ever believe this about this person because he's great. He's a star athlete, he's wonderful, everybody loves him. And so that too sometimes traps individual individuals in these relationships because they don't feel like anyone will believe them. And, and sadly, that is true. You know, as as we get ready to to uh, step away and allow you your time back, you know, it, it, it that, that's very true. A lot of men 
and I won't call, I won't embarrass anybody, but I, I had a, and he's, he's deceased, a friend one time, and his wife kept telling me this, and quite honestly, I went, no, that's not him. You know, he and I, you know, we were growing up as boys, we talked about this, we even talk about this as grown men, et cetera. But, and I'll be very honest with you, until I actually witnessed uh, him in acting out, that he didn't know I was present, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was dumbfounded. So right. I'm, I'm just saying as a male, sometimes those of us that are that are definitely anti-violence uh, against women have to open our eyes and understand just like anything else that you have a lot of people that, and my grandmother called it chin music. You know, you have a lot of people that, that give it chin music, but in, in reality, uh, they are perpetrators themselves. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you know, I'm trying to share that with you because it can't be a very other thing. Now, uh, uh, Teresa has another question. And that's, uh, Teresa, feel free to grab a camera because we're going to shut the show down, sir. Okay. T Teresa has another question. And Teresa is saying, what do you do? <laughs> this is the classic question, uh, Mrs. Jenkins. What do you do when you're in love with someone and they are abusing you, but you do not want to lose them? That's that's definitely um, cliche. That's definitely a question that we often hear. Um, and when we think about the the class question, why doesn't she just leave? Why does this person just leave? Um, and that is usually one of the very first questions because I love them. Um, and I know this too will sound cliche, but I think it comes to you choosing yourself, choosing to love you more than you love this individual. And so that's why it's so important that you recognize those signs early because by the time that pattern of behavior is kicked in, you're isolated, you don't have any friends, um, he's the main breadwinner, his mom keeps the children, um, or what, whatever the case may be. And then you're kind of, what you will see is almost locked in. And that's all you see. Um, and then if he's saying, I love you, and you're saying, I love you back, um, also, what if you've never had a clear and positive perception of what love really is? And a lot of us don't have that. So when someone says they love you, we're more likely to accept it. Um, and let's look at how we grow up again, how we grew up in our families, that we whoop our children and we say we beat you because we love you. Um, if I didn't, if I didn't hit you, if I didn't beat you, I wouldn't love you. Um, you're sitting in class and little Johnny pulls your ponytail and they say, oh, he just pulls your ponytail because he likes you. And so we teach our young at an early age that it's acceptable that love is hurt, that love can hurt. And so we begin to accept that, that theory. Um, and that's what happens a lot of times. But again, if that's a feeling, I think that you should always, always, always Look into that, address what you're feeling emotionally, and seek out help. Wow. You know, I, I, and Teresa is sending you up a lot of thumbs, by the way, and hearts. Uh, Mrs. Jenkins, again, I, I want to respect your time. You've been so gracious uh, to come on tonight and, and to share with us. And again, please allow me to apologize uh, for these glitches. I don't know what happened, but we do want to apologize. Uh, so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, You've just heard from Mrs. Jenkins. She is a community education outreach manager, uh, Mrs. Petrina Jenkins, and she was kind enough to come and talk with you tonight about uh, domestic violence and, and some of the things that go with it, some of the atrocities that happen. And hopefully uh, you guys were able to glean and get a clear cut explanation of domestic violence. We do know that October is deemed Domestic Violence Month. So we do thank you guys for being here. As always, we appreciate you, you, you coming on our audience. Uh, Mrs. Jenkins, we want to thank you so very much and we appreciate you being here. If there's any uh, information you'd like to leave with our audience or any parting words that you might have, please do so at this time. Sure. Um, um, it's not a personal issue. It's not a family issue. It's a community issue. It's very important that we build allies for survivors of violence and that we build bridges in our community to make sure that we are um, available for survivors and that we understand. So everyone plays a role 
in ending domestic violence. So I want us to begin to hold one another accountable. Um, Mr. Melvin, you touched on it briefly about holding other men accountable. Um, domestic violence is not a women's issue. It's actually a men's issue. It's a community issue. Um, and so we've got to begin to change our thought pattern, begin to look at things a little differently in our communities. So thank you. With that stated, Mrs. Jenkins, is there any way you'd like to, if, if they have the uh, desire to contact you, would you like to give some parting information as to how they might do that? Sure. Um, you can reach me at 318-226-5015. Um, or you can always email me at P-E-T-R-P-C-I at gmail.com. Thank you so much for that. Again, audience, we thank you very guys for being here. Listen, this has been the Nobody Asked to Me Guys show. You know how we do it at this show. We don't waste time with cookie cutter questions and wasting people's time with a lot of conversation that doesn't mean anything. So we thank you for being here. We invite you back next Friday. The entire month has been dedicated to domestic violence. We have various guests uh, that will be coming on with us. Please look for the advertisements that will be out there uh, so that you can come and join us again. And we also leave our platform open, guys. If you wish to be a part of the conversation, just please contact me at the Nobody Asked Me Guys show at gmail.com. So again, we want you guys to have a great evening. Mrs. Patrina Jenkins, we so appreciate you being here with us. And we want you to enjoy the rest of your evening and enjoy the weekend. And may God bless you. God bless you. Thank y'all so much. Have a great night, guys.